Hello, Loki lovers. Rory here from Joe and the Big Reviews Key. This will be an audio only recording, so you can just sit back, push play, and hear myself and own discuss episode five of Loki, the second last one. Can you believe it? Like we said, audio only. So you can go potter about and do your bits while you hear us have a slow breakdown over this episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to TBR Spotlight from the Big Review Ski, your companion podcast to Loki on Disney+. Plus. Come with us now on a journey through time and space as we dive deep into Episode 5, Journey into Mystery. My name's Owen and I'm joined by someone who self-loves himself so much that it's rumoured that he's been personally responsible for multiple Nexus events <laughs> across various timelines, including three today already. Count wow. them. One, two, three. Yeah. Well, I was right, Rory Cashin. You're the one doing all the self-loving. How yeah. are you today? I'm good. Yeah, well, you're right. I do like a I do like a good pruning every now and then. So Oh Jesus. Uh yeah, no, like I appreciate that intro. It's very um close to the bone, let's say. <laughs> a bit too real. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, episode five of Loki has just landed this morning. Yes. We both just watched it. Yes. And the first thing that you've said to me is you like, I've got notes. I've got notes. I can got see notes. that notes have been noted. Yeah. Things have been written. Yeah. Is this more notes than usual? Less notes than usual? How many notes are we looking at? I've got like, I've had to write um, like bullet points um, because if I was just to do the notes as they are in my mind, um, it would be, <laughs> it, would, it would just be me reading my notes for the rest of this episode. Fair enough. This was in my mind at points the best episode of Loki so far. And yes. at points, the worst episode of Loki so far. Okay, well, you've got me hooked. You've mm. got me intrigued. But before we get stuck into it, okay. um, I'd like to get a bit serious, please, if that's okay, first of all. Oh, I mean, it's not like you to be serious about yeah. anything. So, I'm, I'm, you know, you've got me hooked. <laughs> well, I'd like to take this moment to officially issue a formal apology <laughs> to you, Rory, uh -huh. uh, to the Big Reviewski family. Um my actual family as well, who aren't speaking to me anymore as a result of my actions, which is fair enough. It's right, understandable. Okay. For shame. Because They're last, shamed. for shame, last week I said something, mm. uh, something I shouldn't have, um, something I wish I could take back and something that was just wrong and really, really, really stupid. So, oh, Rory, God, last this week. This could be anything. <laughs> it literally could be the full <laughs> show. Uh, last week I said this. There's a goat. There's a goat. I thought yeah, it was, with, is it a goat? I th okay, I, I, I looked back twice and I was like, is that a crocodile that he's holding? So I clearly didn't see that right. Um, <laughs> well, no, but, but to he's be wearing fair, his I little didn't. antler things. <laughs> goat horns, yeah. Right. Goat. I said it was a goat. I was adamant it was a goat. I said he was wearing goat horns, but no, he's not wearing goat horns no. because he's not a goat. He no. is and always has been, in fact, an alligator. Yeah. And so for that, I'd like to apologize because, Rory, this is a goat. Yes. This is an alligator. <laughs> Goat. <laughs> alligator. Well, that second one is flatulent for sure. <laughs> I was going to say I haven't had my breakfast yet, so I'm, I'm slightly peckish. This does so explain because oh. right before we started recording, you and Paul got very like. Uh, Machiavellian in the corner you're like so, 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 so good. Whisper, like, whisper whisper what whisper the hell, what the hell is all this um, I thought it was because it was my birthday was coming up but apparently it was just <laughs> no. for this uh, podcast and that's fine don't too, be I stupid guess. about the birthday thing <laughs> listen hopefully that's I was hoping they wouldn't really focus on the alligator goat issue too much in this week's episode no but having just watched it it plays quite a <laughs> key role it sure uh, does throughout. so hopefully we can move on. Do you accept my apology first and foremost? I mean, we all make mistakes, okay? And that's yes. fine. I the the problem my now issue is is that I have to self evaluate because I allowed you to stir me towards believing it was a goat. And I was like, I was sure it was it was a crocodile or something. I was sure of it. And you were like, no, nah, goat. And I was like, I mean, all right. Like he sounds pretty confident about it. So what I need to do is start trusting you less okay, off the back of goat gate. <laughs> 
<laughs> Goat gate. Okay, here we are. Well, um, listen, that's all fair. Um, well, listen, choose whether to believe me or not <laughs> in true Loki fashion. So let's get stuck into the episode because uh, right at the start, this opening scene, we kind of get, it's almost like a mini recap, this one twisty, turny shot as it brings mm. us through the TVA, uh, the decapitated timekeeper. Uh, which we now know is a mindless android, uh, through the ruined city. And we're still wondering, where is this place? Uh, into the golden uh, elevator doors. And <laughs> I was trying to, I think I almost pulled like a muscle in my neck, like trying to follow everything that, that was going on. But uh, you have to admire the writers immediately because Loki's pretty much his first words are like, what is this place? Where are we? And who are you? And well, to be fair to them, Richard E. Grant does step up and answer those questions straight away. Well, he does and he doesn't. We've got, we've actually, like, yeah, when it lands, well, here's Loki now, he's he's asking the questions that we would all have wanted. Well, we were asking both every episode so far and specifically at the start of this episode. I'd like to suggest we take a quick breather so I can ask several thousand questions. Tom, so, gotta keep moving so we don't die. I can get behind that or what's your plan? Don't die. Okay, understood, but beyond that. Don't die. Don't die isn't a plan. It's a general demand of living. If you're Lokis, you should always have a plan. Will someone please explain to me what the hell is going on? Yeah, so that's we're we're all Loki, which is actually one of my running theories. But uh, in this in this moment, we're all like, "What is happening now? What? Why? Why? And what? And where? And when? And how? And um, who?" I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Richard E. Grant he spits it out. He goes, "This is the void. That's Alioth, and we're his lunch." come on and off they go mm. and so immediately you're like swirling and you're like who the who the hell is Elliot? so you look over at this massive cloud uh well bellowing beast essentially in mm. the sky um so have we any do you want to jump into what or who or when it is now yes i can see you nodding excitedly yeah so i've got some stuff on Elliot. one is uh i don't like big cloud creatures in movies fair enough um, we got one in Ang Lee's Hulk at the end. Didn't care for it. We got one in, uh, what was it? Rise of the Silver Surfer. Remember we had that big angry cloud? Yeah. We got one <laughs> angry clouds. in um, the Green Lantern. It was a big angry cloud. Um, and I think there was another one somewhere. in the, was Is the thing at the end of Doctor Strange, that big floaty thing, that was kind of an, an evil oh, cloud Oh, Dormammu. Well. Yeah. That, that big boy. He's kind of more of a big kind of head and existential kind of celestial being type job. But yeah, I'm sure he takes a cloud form every so often. <laughs> I mean, to, get, to scoot around. <laughs> but yeah, like, it's uh, it seems to be a hang-up on superhero movies. Where it's like, how do we... How do we get across that this is evil, but without having to go back to how it looked like in the comic book? And we're like, we'll make it a cloud. Um, and the other ones weren't clouds, the ones I listed there, whereas Alioth is a cloud in the comic books. He's an evil cloud. And he kind of rules a part in the comic books that's just basically limbo. And the only reason why Alioth hasn't broken free of limbo and started devouring all matter and energy in every timeline is because of one person who has kept it in check for thousands of years. And that one person who has kept it in limbo is Kang the Conqueror. Oh, that guy's back again. Yes. So we have mentioned him a lot because in the comic books, uh, Kang's girlfriend or, well, some, sometimes girlfriend is uh, Ravonna Renslayer. Although when she becomes his girlfriend, he she then renames herself as Terminatrix. Not oh, that's kidding. Just the great, that's the greatest <laughs> name of all time. Um. And we, there was also the rumours that one of the timekeepers looked an awful lot like Jonathan Majors, who is playing Kang the Conqueror in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania in 2023. So there's, it's all tying back to Kang in the comic books, but as we know from the MCU, sometimes they like you to lead you down a garden path, and either it's exactly what you thought it was all along, or, you know, it wasn't. So the, the best guess we have right now is that this is all bringing us back to Kang uh, but yeah, that's who Alioth is. Okay, so that's that cleared up. Um, I was disappointed to hear that Richard E. Grant called the place the Void, um, because I did prefer our term of uh, prunatory from last week anyway. But that is much better. Listen, we'll stick we'll stick with the actual Marv uh, Marvel official titles. Um, so then we're back into the TVA, and immediately where we left off last week, where Sylvie has got uh basically ren slayer's on the ground she's completely vulnerable she's saying just prove me i don't care whatever um 
And so begins like Renslayer basically trying to be a sort of Loki because she's like, you can trust me. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Let's work together. Um, so, but we do get uh, a little bit more information into the explanation of pruning and what it is and that it's somebody they haven't been destroyed. They've just been transferred uh, ultimately, obviously, in the hope that this beast, this angry cloud, uh, devours them once they get there. Um, we still don't really know why. She says it's at the end of time. Everything collides at the same point and just stops there. We're not really sure. Again, Sylvie doesn't believe Because it's still her. being written, I think. She's yeah, saying that yeah. the end of time is still being created. I do have a tiny problem with this scene. Th- that's not in the same room where the last episode ended. Where, yeah, yeah, they bring her down to the interrogation room, it looks like. Uh, yeah, so it's almost as if... She, how did she get her through all the security standing outside the timekeeper's room? And then get her into another room to do that. But you see, I actually, do you know what? I need to go back and check something in last week's episode because I thought I thought exactly the same thing. Right. I was like, oh, it has the numbers on the wall behind them. So it must be one of the interrogation rooms again. And same thought is like, how did she move her down? Because Renslayer is still lying on the ground in the same position yeah. as she was at the end of last week. But I just think maybe whenever... Uh, the timekeepers powered down last week, the androids, uh, presumably their smoke machine was, uh, you know, shut off as well. Uh And then that might still be part of the design of the back of that room. So we need to check. It's It's not not because all behind them in the, in the timekeepers room was like an MC Escher painting. It was like the stairs going in millions of different directions. Wherein in this, it just looks like Ravona's courtroom because when, um, Sylvie makes a jump for it at the end. She hops behind the the kind of court bench, yeah, which definitely wasn't in their smoke machine room. So she, they have moved to another room, but without showing us how they got there, which is a lazy, not a fan. No, do you know what? It's time travel. It's time travel and temp pads. Just don't, don't question it. All right, all right. Yeah. and that's that completely cleared up. Okay, uh, no issues whatsoever. So. That's that. Then we jump back into the void and we're seeing it's a whole mixture of um, it's like the Bermuda Triangle of stuff like the pirate ships. And uh, mm. there's a helicopter in the background with Thanos written on it. Yes. I don't know if that means anything. <laughs> I mean, I know this who Thanos will is. be like frame by frame Easter egg stuff. Oh, 100 percent. Because I'm sure we're like at the very when we come into it first and we kind of land into the city and it does that pan straight across and you can see again the Avengers Terrors ruined. Off yeah. to one side. There's one building that's standing at the front. Oh yes, it looks that's like right. a it looks yeah. like a lighthouse or something. And I because I was like, well, I don't know where we are, um, so there's no point in paying attention to it. But later, when stuff is shown to us, I was like, I'm gonna have to go back and go through all this. And I'm sure that that first landmark that we're shown is going to be something because well, we'll get to it. But there's there's something else that's dropped into the void later on. And it's it's got DB Cooper esque mystery backstory behind it, but we'll get to that. Amazing. Okay. Okay. So looking forward to that. So, um, as I say, we're back in the void, and the Lokis are kind of getting together. And no matter what, uh, our Loki is mm. trying to get out of them. They're like, no, the plan is just don't die, don't die, don't die. Yeah, uh, it's a good plan. I support it. So this is when they find their like lost season two bunker. In yeah, they're in, in, that they're they're hiding out in, and um, that's where we see the Thanos helicopter, and we do a pan through the ground, and we see like lunch trays. So, and you've got a question I can see already. Go on. Th- this the- is one of my favorite parts of the episode because uh-huh. it feels like there's so much more in this. Because as you said, uh, it starts to pan down as mm. they're obviously traveling down into their bunker, their lost bunker. Actually, I'm glad you brought up Lost because that Thank was you. the other angry cloud I was thinking of, the big smoke monster in Lost. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was, and it, it kind of has the the tentacles, the black smoke ones. The tentacles, yeah, so, absolutely. Um, so uh, this pan down the way. So as you said, first of all, like loads of dinner trays, like school dinner trays mm. or something. Then Mjolnir, just a, like a a, a yep. massive Mjolnir. Uh, and then what I thought was, it's somebody. I kept rewinding it. Is it a tiny Thor? So when I watched it first, my first thought was, remember in Avengers Assembled when yeah. he's trapped Thor into that glass cage and he drops it from the helicarrier. And Thor, right. can't, Thor has to like fly around and he uses his hammer to get over. I thought it was that and Thor hadn't made it over in this timeline. Okay. But then I went back and looked at it again and it's actually Throg. 
Who's Throg? Pran, thank you. Thank you so much for setting that up for me. Throg is Thor as a frog. Are you serious? Yes, Throg. <laughs> so, <laughs> hold on. Now, are you sure it's not a goat? Uh, do you have sound clips for me to go back and forth between a frog and a goat? You don't. <laughs> if I'd known we were... <laughs> <laughs> that was unexpected. Do you have a Looks frog like on I hand? I do. <laughs> um, but no, it's uh, no, it is. It's it's Throg. So, because I rewind it a couple of times, uh, and I'll have to rewind it again because I saw like a red cape. I thought like, yep. kind of jumping up and down. Um, well, that makes sense. Frogs jump, so of course. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but it in, the, con- so in the context sense. of of the show, it's no no bigger a mystery than anything else, I guess. <laughs> Like, it's amazing, because then I was thinking, right, are they going to make Mjolnir some kind of important plot point? But like, no, it's not. It's just, these are just, as you said, these are just nuggets and Easter mm. eggs and other food-related I, terms for I small d- hidden things. Do you have, like, I want to know why there's so many lunch trays. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, well, actually, because a school bus pops up later on, so there's been some poor school buses uh, and yeah. school children, presumably, have been <laughs> pruned uh, into the void. Yep. Uh, but at, at, at this moment, um, we get some explanations. I know you, you've already gone into what uh, Aliath is. Uh, from the different Lokis, they say he's a monster in the sky, a living tempest that consumes matter and energy. And I like uh, Richard E. Grant's classic Loki's version of it. He says he's a shark tank, and Aliath is the shark as well. And again, they just sit here, and you could watch a sitcom of these guys just all kind of sitting in their really comfy chairs. And again, speaking of Easter eggs, I'm sure this place is absolutely jam-packed. Yeah. Uh, in the bunker with um, all their various things. There's arcade games, there's candy cane sticks, there's a bowling alley, a bath as well. Different letters scattered about the place as well that seem to have been taken from a carnival or a fun fair. And, you know, again, the writers and set designers are probably just having a lot of fun going, everybody is going to lose their mind, you yeah. know, pausing every uh, single frame um, at this moment. So uh, I loved their little uh, setup here, and obviously, when they just start exchanging stories about, uh, well, Boastful Loki, obviously, just explaining how great he actually is as well. Yeah, Boastful Loki, he killed our, our Captain America and Iron Man, apparently. So he says, but they don't believe him. Then. They don't believe him. Uh, Kid Loki said he killed Thor. That was his nexus mm-hmm. point. That was a bit of a out of the blue. That was just as they were going into the bunker. He's like, "I killed Thor," and you're like, "Ooh, he dark though." Kid Loki's dangerous. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed. I, I can't remember if it was here or later on, but it does feed back nicely into, um, the, the overall arcing kind of thing around Loki. And that it, when we hear Richard E. Grant tell his nexus point was essentially missing his brother and wanting. Con- wanting human con- well not human contact like contact like company again and the nexus point is proving to be that anytime a Loki chooses not to be alone that's when the TVA close in because they're meant to be alone yeah uh, which does tie up nicely to the gross interactions <laughs> between uh, Loki and Sylvie which we're still petered out a bit in this um We'll get to it, but like I did enjoy, yeah, they all, especially Richard E. Grant, because he he really nailed like the the comedy, and then that kind of very sad, just kind of I'm meant to be uh, all by myself in this entire universe, and I like, pushed everyone away, and you're like, oh, Richard E. Grant, oh, yeah, that moment when he says, "I was lonely, I miss my brother." Uh, I know you've got brothers, uh, Rory, or maybe one. I don't know. I don't look into your personal life. Thank I've you. got brothers, but that that bit that bit hit me hard. And one of them thinks he's a god as well. So um, <laughs> that kind of ties into into all of that. Just in between this little sequence in the bunker, they break it up very slightly to go back to the TVA, where Miss Minutes p- pops back up, and we had heartbreaking. <laughs> what was heartbreaking My heart about this is moment? Broken. Miss Minutes isn't good. This is the well. Hold on a wee second, pump the brakes, because Miss Minutes is still doing what Renslayer tells her to do or asks her to do. She never asked her to, to lie. She lied. Oh, she well, was that, like, I'm totally looking for this file, you totally... I. She she instigated looking for a made-up file. Miss Minutes did that. When she mentioned the Void spacecraft. All, and I, the second she was like, well, there is the Void spacecraft. And you're like, oh yeah, I was like... Sylvia, how stupid are you? Get get the hell out of there. They're clearly stalling for time. It's like, how much um, longer? Oh, not not too much longer now until I totally find this file. Don't you even yeah, worry Miss about Minutes, it. Like, well, 
it's brilliant uh, the part of the, the visual effects crew who have created her because they give her her perfect facial expression um, and she's like yeah I'm, I'm just scrolling <laughs> through here just going to find this file any second now and giving um, Renslayer those kind of wee looks as well I'm going to be honest I was completely gullible and I fell for all I was like maybe you know what maybe Renslayer isn't so bad maybe there is a void spacecraft so I kept losing myself in the moment and mm. then being completely like having the rug pulled out for me uh immediately now over i'm not over again. sure how bad she is yet yes she's bad for sure because she is prune happy and a liar and she, she keeps like especially when she was a b15 she's interrogating oh yes yeah, she interrogates her later in the episode she's a meanie pants in that scene but like um i'm still not I, I'm still unsure as to how much he does or doesn't know. Uh, so I will give that to uh, Gugu and Bathora that she's, she's still kind of perfectly balancing that line of yeah. where do you actually fall on the good to evil ratio. Uh, so yeah, so that's still one kind of mystery for me is that uh, how involved actually is she. Perfectly balanced. As everything should be. Thanos mm. would be a fan of her. He would. Definitely. Yeah, if he if she hadn't pruned him, probably. <laughs> also, this speaking of pruning, this is the moment where Sylvie self prunes herself. Big and the guard turns around, she self pruned herself, <laughs> which is uh, a great line. Um, but yeah, she kind of says, I have one good memory. And I presume, are we talking about, as you, you know, the icky moment, uh, icky in your eyes anyway? Um, from last week's episode. I'm wondering, is that the one good moment? It might be. But anyway, she prunes herself, and obviously uh, we see her waking up uh, in the school bus in the void slightly later. But just on the um, back to the bunker scene, because there's a couple of things in here in terms of those Easter eggs I spotted. There's mm. uh, They're drinking Roxy box wine, <laughs> which is it's just a box wine, um, and it says like exceptional Pinot Noir, um, <laughs> which you know, red wine definitely uh, feels like a very low key drink as well. Yep. The music in the background, I hadn't realized until I saw it in the credits later. Um, it's actually it's Oasis, it's Wonderwall, um, but it's a it's a different version. It's the Mike Flowers pops version, like a real kind of lounge, easy <laughs> listening uh, type job as well. So Wonderwall's on the background uh, as well, as you said, classic Loki tells his story. Uh, at this moment um, it did feel like there was a bit of a predator moment here um, whenever they're building Loki up and he's saying listen if it's a shark then we can we can kill sure. the shark and it's like full Arnie going if it bleeds we can kill it uh, and again the others just kind of laughing at him but this is the moment when Loki is just like you know I give up um, I'm going to go outside the bunker open the bunker and there we have President Loki, as he's officially known, yep. uh, according to the uh, the subtitles and the credits as well. So this was the moment uh, he kind of looks up, sees the other Loki with all the guys around, and he says, this is a nightmare. And I wrote down the notes, I was like, this episode is a lot of fun, just. There's so much <laughs> fun going on. Like, they're definitely having a lot of crack with this as well. Then we're back to Sylvie waking up again, uh, and I thought... She was using her magic here. I didn't understand what was happening whenever she catches this glimpse of... No, me neither. That was confusing. Really confusing. Yeah. Because I thought, is that Asgard she's looking at? Or where is she? Yeah. I, I just, I didn't know what was going on. Obviously, we get a bit more uh, information on that later on whenever she says, oh, no, I was able to almost find a connection with uh, Alioth whenever I managed to, to touch her. But the next thing is we hear a horn honking and... Uh, this was like any time a horn is honking, I get excited anyway. But um, what did you think of this moment when it's fucking Mobius rocks up again? Uh, thankfully, not dead. Yeah, like it was, uh, happiness, just great. Oh, thank God he's back. Like you missed him, even though he wasn't gone that long this time. Um, I will have to look more into uh, it was obviously a, a pizza delivery car. Yeah, not a jet ski. He, he, no, unfortunately not. Um, it's coming. It has to. <laughs> it has to come there. Um, but yeah, a pizza, a pizza car. So I wonder if that's tied to anything. I didn't catch the name of the pizza delivery service or uh, whatever. I just saw the, 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 the word pizza on the car uh, yeah. as well as giant slice of pizza as yeah. well. But no, that was it. Uh, and then they hook up and not hook up. They get into. I have to be very careful with words we use because hook up actually. <laughs> so she gets into the car and they they drive off and he, they have a nice little bantery back and forth uh, and escape. So yeah, like it's this is the first proper time we've seen the two of these together. Yeah, 
on screen uh, and it pays off actually fantastically well later in the episode um but yeah no it's it's just it's he's just so great in this like i don't have a bad word to say about on wilson and Norman, if you just said to me prior to 2021 Owen Wilson is going to steal the show in one of these. Like, he's not that great. He kind of plays himself in everything. And if for some reason, that's totally fine here. It just works so magnificently. So, yeah, just, I was just, w- w- the second I seen the car arrive, I was like, it, I didn't even know it was him yet, but I knew it was him and I was just happy. Are you in love with Owen Wilson? Yeah, I want to kiss him. Okay, fair enough. Uh, We'll see if we can get that set up. Um, So we're back into President Loki in the bunker, and this is the scene where everybody doubles, triple, quadruple crosses each other, where it turns out they were all playing each other all along in terms of trying to claim the throne of, Mm. like, King of the Lokis in this kingdom. Um, There is a brilliant insult in here. You get the, you beef-witted half-face scrubs, (laughs) um, which again felt like old... Uh, original Loki anyway. But again, in terms of having the fun and playing things for laughs, it looks like there are Lokis who have fashioned Loki helmets just out of bits and pieces of things they have found, whereas some of them have more elaborate, like golden crowns. But the funniest bit in this episode for me anyway was whenever uh, each time someone discovers that the alligator is actually another Loki variant, or they think it is anyway, and then the Loki... (laughs) The alligator runs over and just bites off his hand <laughs> immediately. And he just he holds his like bloody stump up and he just screams basically. Uh which is uh yeah, no, I just I watched the scream uh, a number of times. <laughs> yeah, no, it was uh the the alligator Loki was used for so many great punchlines. Yeah. In this. Um there's another one later on where where he's <laughs> he's the alligator just growled something. And Loki's like, see, he's on board. And classic yeah. Loki's like, no, no, he's he's praying because he thinks he's we're praying. all gonna die. It's it, like it's uh, it should not have worked as well as it did. And also, when um, the alligator first goes for Tom Hiddleston, Loki, I think, yeah, and then they have to kind of wrestle him off and like throw him <laughs> back into the pool. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's uh, and every now and again they'll just cut back to it, and he, it's just like doing a weird bug-eyed blink. Uh, people in the room it's just it's very funny that's it It, as you said it's used for multiple punchlines and they're all perfectly uh played and then it is that look because um there's a moment whenever i think right near the start of the episode whenever our loki says something and all the loki's kind of look at each other uh giving each other like a new look and they include the alligator loki yeah. and its eyes are just poking <laughs> all over the place so no it's uh it's really really well done um so in the the hustle and the bustle of boastful Thor or boastful um, Loki shouting at the others, he's like, "Take that, Loki!" <laughs> Which is just a, a great line because they're all just whacking each other. Um, classic Loki, Kid Loki, Alligator Loki, and our Loki all escape, uh, and they decide to to make their way uh, towards uh, Alioth. And then at the very same time, uh, the conversation in the car between Mobius and Sylvie, they're kind of having the same revelation, and she's mm-hmm. like, "We need to go." Um, to whatever that thing is, uh, the angry cloud, as Owen Wilson calls it. And again, I presume Owen Wilson came up with that. And so he's like, let's go to the angry cloud. But just before both parties converge at the at the foot, I don't know if he even has feet, uh, of Alioth, we get this giant warship, mm. um, which drops out of the sky, which has obviously been pruned or reset from some other timeline. And those poor sailors, uh, they don't know what they're in for. But was this the moment you were teasing me with? Yes, I, I am a terrible tease. One quick question. What was that thingy that Kid Loki was carrying? Did you see the little oh, device he was yeah. walking around with? I thought, for a moment, I thought it was like a remote control car controller. And I was like, I don't remember seeing any remote control car anyway. So they didn't set that up, sure they didn't? They didn't explain what that was? No, no. The, the, the first moment I saw it as well was whenever they were walking along and he had it in his hand. So maybe there was something and it was slightly rewritten, potentially, or maybe, no, I don't think it's going to come back. And well, well, see, I was like, oh, does he, is this using, is he using this to pull stuff into the void? Okay. You know, like, because uh, he, because they knew that's where the ship was going to land. And they yeah. were like, we can use this to, as a, as a, uh, a divergence so we can you know a distraction so we can get to the butt i guess of <laughs> Alioth yeah that's and what sta- they're aiming stab for it, stab if it from behind if he's got feet he's got a butt <laughs> um so yeah they didn't really explain because i was like oh maybe he's using that to to pull stuff in or maybe they've somehow figured out 
when and where in the void new stuff was going to arrive and maybe that's yeah. they, maybe that's how they knew where Tom Hiddleston Loki was landing at the start yeah. of the episode possibly yeah that that would kind of feed into how they were able to be there in order to because they they were rescuing him essentially yeah uh in a way and it would be quite a coincidence if they just happened to be in the same place at the same time whenever he landed there um i was more thinking that connection definitely works in that in that regard i was thinking it was more they were just making their way towards Alith because he basically just moseys around and things are dropping it's not unlike um in Thor Ragnarok, in Sakaar, do you remember when the rubbish is dropping onto mm. the planet and pl- portals just keep opening, essentially? So that what is what reminded, uh, or that's what I was reminded of watching it anyway. But you're right, maybe there is something in that little remote control car device that uh, that he was carrying around as well. So they arrive, and the USS Eldritch is the name of the, the warship that drops out of the sky, and it still has all of its crew on board. So off to Google I went. And <laughs> the USS Eldritch was a warship that was was used by the US um, during World War II. Um, and there's a big internet conspiracy around a thing called the Philadelphia Experiment. Have you ever heard of this? I have. Um, it's the lovely, delicious cream cheese I put on my baguette sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, aside from your experiments with cream cheese, this is the... Uh, basically, the rumor was that the US government was using crashed alien technology that would allow them to either completely make something uh, vanish to the human eye, or transport it from one place to another so around 1943 all these um theories and conspiracies came out that uh, they had tested something on board the eldritch and a an ominous blue glow uh surrounded the entire ship and it disappeared and it reappeared in another port hundreds of miles away and the same uh rumors and theories and stuff around it say that all the crew were who were on board at the time they all went mad or there was another one where people came on board the eldritch and people uh the crew had actually become fused to the ship (laughs) so it's a huge uh you know bermuda triangle-esque db cooper-esque uh running rumor in america like this thing about the philadelphia experiment and the uss eldritch so loki is once again tying into uh conspiracies and theories thinking that the Eldritch hadn't actually uh, disappeared and reappeared, but it had re- disappeared and then landed here in the void to be kind of a snack, I guess, for Devoured. Alia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I love that the way that, again, the writers are just pulling on those real world examples uh, and conspiracy theories and just making it kind of fit in this. It's lovely when you get those kind of, oh, because now in my head, whenever I hear the Philadelphia experiment again or anything about that ship, I'll be like, I know exactly what happened. You don't remember in real life they were pruned and they went into the <laughs> void. Um, so that's that's the way it exists in my head now. But that's all that's all amazing to know. You, What's this thing? Google? That's amazing. That's class your cast at googling stuff yeah thanks it's a it's a it's a mixture of googling and wikipediaing it's called nice. journalism i uh, incredible I'm work a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan but yeah no oh. so that landing made me think oh i'm gonna have to go back and see if there is a story about some missing pizza car or if there is a story <laughs> about a, a school bus that disappeared or uh, something to do with the lunch trays or whatever that building was when we first landed in the void the, yes. the lighthouse all of that stuff is now probably laced with these real life theories that of, of people disappearing or places disappearing, um, and now have all landed in the void somehow. So, I fully expect this for the next day or two. BuzzFeed or whomever to have like 70, 77 examples of things in Loki that had tied into the real world of how they all disappeared in real life um, and actually they're all debunked theories because as it turns out the Philadelphia experience was massively debunked because the ship was sold like a few years later to Greece or something so all right there you go <laughs> what a what an underwhelming finish to that. <laughs> <laughs> but no it reminds me of uh, do you remember that show Ripley's Believe It or Not yes and they always had like the the a room full of those kind of artifacts and things. It feels like this landscape is that is like that room in Ripley's Believe It or Not, where as you said, ooh, that's related to that case, and that's that story over there. Because at one point I thought that it looked like the Golden Gate Bridge or something as well, mm. uh, away over uh, in another section. Is there? As far as I know, the Golden Gate Bridge 
is still present uh, and correct as well. But there's that um, other bridge. Remember, was a, there was a film called The Mothman Prophecies. Did you ever see that with Richard Gere? No. Um, <clears throat> and all these people who were in the town were having like a shared prophecy, and it's based on a true story as well, of their big local bridge collapsing, and then it did. So maybe so, it's that bridge. There you go. <laughs> So don't be surprised if we see, forget Richard E. Grant, if we see Richard Gere in the next episode uh, <laughs> of Loki then as well. So they converge, as we said, uh, on Alioth and they kind of, they have an idea, they realize it's not going to work. And then we have this little bit of this calm before the storm um, as everyone kind of shares these little moments. There's a campfire. Mm. There are, I, I don't want to, we'll get to the to the icky moment. Mm. I was going to say romantic, but I know how you feel about this. Uh, not what I was going to say about this kind of stuff in general, Roy, but specifically because you believe that these two are, are brother and sister. But what yeah. do you think of this little moment? At the start, there was like, um, I was trying to figure out whether there was a clue in the registration plate of the vehicle. And it looked like it said GRN. W1D and I was like GRN could be green W1D could be wand <laughs> green wand is that a reference to Loki as well so then my head is just spinning essentially but uh we get Mobius kid Loki and uh classic Loki all sitting around talking to each other in a lovely wee scene yeah like this this scene here with uh well we have a clip of it here it's uh Owen Wilson and Richard E. Grant just basically shooting the shit about a, a, a magical alligator. And you just couldn't, you couldn't ask for anything better than this. You really don't remember him? I mean, TVA had arrested a lot of Lokis, but no, I don't remember an alligator. I mean, who's to say he's even a Loki variant? He's green, isn't he? I don't know, he could be lying. The long con, of course, that just makes him more likely to be a Loki. It's always the game within the game with you guys, which I respect. Yeah, so like that's great. I love that. It's so that good. I love. It's so good. I that is fantastic. And then we hard cut from that to icky icky grossness. Now, <laughs> you 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 Owen, why is this my fault? I'm not saying it's your fault yet. Give me a second to assign blame. So I can I can sense it in your tone. No no no. So you're like Rory. Why are you fine with this? Are, do you are you totally on board with this? No, I I get. <laughs> uh, I don't. Mm, Own. I have mixed feelings about it. I'll be perfectly honest. Yeah, my mixture of feelings are gross and ick. That's it's those two feelings mixed together. So I actually, what you're saying is you are okay with this self cessed vibe. If this is within, okay with you. <laughs> within within the narrative of the story, yes, oh. I can see how it works, and I can see how it makes. Uh, and even you were saying it last week in terms of how it makes sense in the storytelling uh, part of it that it's taken this particular nexus event and this realization. None of this would hold up in court, would it? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, <laughs> You're giving a I real actually, political answer, and I don't. I, know, I, I actually, don't care I, for it. Can I can I read you out? Because I know you've got uh, notes and notes scroll there, but I actually wrote something down. I wrote down romantic Loki first because he he says I could conjure you up a blanket. To be fair, Sylvie calls him on it the worst looking blanket Awful. in the world. Like it looks so thin and crap. Uh, she does say, "Is it a tablecloth?" <laughs> Which is uh, fair enough. But I had in capital letters says like it's getting icky, Rory. And yep. then it also um, I could I I wrote I think I could hear you screaming all the way across Ireland <laughs> uh, as the scene as they got closer uh, and closer and they realized uh, you know are we what's happening here because as I said they don't know how to have friends and or she doesn't know how to have friends and they kind of let it kind of trail off as well even though she did talk about having that postman previously who we think might be uh stan lee in his in his fedex delivery uniform <laughs> yeah um but yeah were you that this all of this you were just like ready to book basically i yeah okay so you need to catch people up who don't live in Derry about book because i that's oh, another sorry. thing i had to hit google uh, up for it during the week Sorry, boke is, uh, yeah, it's another word for puke, basically. So you were ready to puke yeah. and vom all yeah. over your screen. I was unhappy with the direction <laughs> this love. this scene was going in. Like, I just, it's gross. I don't like it. And you'd think, having watched Game of Thrones, you'd be like, well, I'm, I'm you know, desensitized to what could potentially be an incesty vibe. But for some reason, I don't know, it just feels so much worse. It's just, I, I hate it. And as they were, like, as he, like, then enlarged his tablecloths so it kind of engulfed them both i was like oh yeah. no <laughs> but then smooth move to be fair there was a 
there was a glimmer of hope for me because she said I never really had friends before. Yeah. And maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's just like she he just like he just likes her yeah. as a person, but not likes her as wants to bone her. And that's and the same with her. But I swear to I swear to Christ, you will hear me cracking too if they kiss in the show. I will be it's so on I, I know and I hate it. I it's hate it. It's coming. I hate it. That's it. Do you know I what? just hate it. I do you know the reason I think I don't mind this storyline as much as you do, this particular element is because I think I just love hearing you get so worked up about it. <laughs> and I think that that kind of clouds uh my 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 vision of it insofar as like I just the angrier you get, the funnier I think it is. So I'm ready for a full on Sylvie Loki snog in episode six for the season finale what? as well. Um so just before just before the two of them uh go on to to confront uh Aliath and after this this little campfire scene uh as well, they all start to go their separate ways. Uh Kid Loki and Classic Loki head off in one direction. And Mobius kind of has this lovely moment um, where they do the whole, they, they give each other this big, lovely hug yeah. uh, between Mobius and Logan. He says, you know, I'm going to go back and burn the TVA to the ground. So it'd be Loved interesting it. to see how much they focus on him going back into the TVA then as well. Yeah, no, I love that scene. I like because he was he had his hand out for a handshake. Yeah, and Moby was like, "Nah, come here, we pals." Um, and it was a proper hug, and I was like, "Oh, my emotions!" And then even over his shoulder, he said to Sylvie, "He's like, you're my favorite one." That was brilliant. Was like, That's yeah. so cute, and oh, but I like see. I don't. I'm not adverse to nice things. I just don't like it when it's. The, when it's no, I don't like the other one. But like, I did like this one. This was this was lovely. And then he popped through, and I do hope he gets his. Uh, I hope he kills someone with a jet ski in the final episode. I Is hope, that too much to ask? I don't think so. I don't think. I think they've really set up Chekhov's gets jet ski at this point. <laughs> so um, yeah, I hope that's what happens for him. I, I only I only want good for good good things, and and that he does find out who what his life was before. He was taken over and put into the TVA. Um, yeah, you, you can definitely see him in like uh, what are they called? One of those little tiki bars on a beach where oh, he's yeah. wearing like a Hawaiian shirt. And he's uh, like Paul just, Rudd in um, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Forgetting Sarah, <laughs> Sarah Marshall. Yeah, exactly. That's the ending we want for like, him. Yeah, he owns like a little jet ski rental business in like Perfect. some beautiful little uh, secluded beach. No, that sounds good. But yeah, the little throw of uh, "You're my favorite" over to Sylvie was just uh, was just perfect. Then. Okay, now we're down to, to two. Uh, we're down to Loki and Sylvie. Uh, and Loki goes full um, Jurassic Park, basically, you know, with Jeff Goldblum. And he kind of lights up yep. this blade that kid Loki has given him. He's trying to get uh, Elliot's attention. And it doesn't appear to be where he's over here. And then you get this Richard E. Grant. I'm going to say redemption moment. I mean, it's not so much redemption because throughout the episode, as you said, he's kind of, he's already opened himself up to everybody. And we realize that he... He seems old, well. He is older, but he seems wiser, mm. and uh, he just is like this is moment. Whenever he turns around and looks back, and you realize I'm going to have to help them here, and I should help them here as well. But this was a goosebumps moment for me, and I was just thinking, how how can I be so emotionally attached to someone I've only just <laughs> like see? He only just popped up at the. He wasn't even in the last episode. He was in the credits of the last episode, and already he's had this full arc. Um, where again, that's testament to Richard E. Grant and his acting ability, uh, and the writing as well, and how they've come together to create this character. Where uh, at this moment, when he was given at socks and raising this illusion of was it just Asgard, or was there elements of other places in there as well? I wasn't a hundred percent sure. Um, but in order to dis- distract Ali, but did you like this this moment for him here? Yeah, I did. Um. Oh, I, I, me. <laughs> no, I, I, like it was, it was good. Like, I think part of the reason, like, it is Grant's performance, it is he's been given some great lines. Uh, and it's also, it's tied back to our feelings about Loki himself because we feel this is just our Tom Hiddleston Loki further in the future and he's lived a very lonely life. Yeah. And we, we do have a connection to him now as well. I personally would have conjured up something that could move around and, would have Alioth kind of chasing it rather than just a huge city that 
and he tries to eat. <laughs> um, it, it's like that's a lot of energy to put into something that will only distract for a few seconds. So I was like, oh, that's impressive. And then immediately I was like, wait, where did he, why did he do that? Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was, a, it was a nice moment. And, and it was, it, I think it was, it's, it's not so much a redemption for that Loki. It's a redemption for Lo, Lokis in general, saying they are capable of self-sacrifice. Um, yeah. But we kind of know that already because he did it before. Um, I know, I know. But it was still like it's it's a nice it's a nice moment and I think Richard E. Grant is the reason why it worked as well as it did. Um, Definitely. And while all that's happening, the two Sylvie and uh, Tom Hiddleston and Loki have grabbed one of the smoky tendrils and Tom Hiddleston's like, I can't do it, I don't have this power, I can't uh, so he was like, I believe in you, you totally can, don't you worry about it and then he can kiss. <laughs> Gross. And then they can uh and they they kind of just green smoke it i guess <laughs> that's yeah, the best turn, way i can use it to they, describe they it turn its coloring from kind of blacky purpley into green and that's how you know it's worked yep that's the loki color and it's worked green to go yeah i love sorry just in that previous but i love that your takeaway from that richard e grant moment is like you know what if i was a loki i would have done it better so um i, I wouldn't have died that <laughs> I, I wouldn't have died okay maybe he just want maybe he was like do you know what fuck it i'm giving up <laughs> you know this is this this is my moment uh oh, who sang that this is my moment. This is my perfect this is moment. My perfect moment. Oh, was that um, one from EastEnders? Yeah, she was in Martin Novak, McCutcheon. So that's the we, one. So this is this I is hope we Martin don't, McCutcheon. Uh, get copyright infringement for that perfect <laughs> reenactment sure. of that song. I think we sang it so badly, no one's going to come for us. Um, but yeah, so this was his Martin McCutcheon moment anyway. Um, speaking of music, um, Natalie Holt does something lovely here as well, where she uh, uses uh, a slightly different version of the ride of the valkyries theme mm. tune um a theme tune the music <laughs> wagner richard wagner's uh music which is based on uh elements of norse mythology uh, mythology anyway so it's a really nice tie in here because as well we know from uh sylvie's past whenever she was uh taken from her own timeline originally she was playing with her toys and she was uh reenacting you know some valkyries coming to save people as well so as this music is playing with uh classic loki raising this um massive illusion um this music is kicked in as well so no it, it works it's, it's just a nice little moment there um from natalie holt the composer as well so uh, that just adds to the to the production uh, of everything as well. And then, as you said, the enchantment works. Yeah. Um, and do you know why it works? Because they were holding hands. Uh, so that's that's uh, what gives them that extra boost of power. Yeah. And then the cloud opens up. And what are we looking at here? Because I was like, what is this, this structure, this castle? Is it the one maybe that you said, you know, we spotted as we arrived in the void earlier? Is it Hogwarts? <laughs> is it Bifrost coloring? Uh, I was kind of like, where do I recognize this from? But I, I'm, I'm not sure if I even do. So what did you think of this moment as the clouds parted? Yeah, it, it, my first thought was it's the opening credits of Little House in the Prairie. It looked, <laughs> um, it looked all golden and nice in there. And I was like, ah, uh, but we know it's, it's not good news whenever they pass through uh, Alioth to make their way to whatever it is over there. I don't think we've seen it before, um, whatever yeah. it is. Um, and... I'm sure, because again, there was there was something that was like, oh, Alioth is the guard dog of whoever set all this up. I was like, that's quite a presumption to make, um, because nobody really knew up until this episode that pruning people would send. Because all right, and then we're going way back. Ravana was like, you can't delete stuff from the timeline. You can only move it from one timeline to another one and the one we're moving it to was the void and then Alioth is there and Alioth will eat it up that's pretty much what she said right yeah why not just get a gun and shoot people in the head if that's like is that not more uh, efficient <laughs> like if you need to kill someone your stick your actual time sticks have a spear on the other end so just use that end if you want to effectively efficiently kill someone as opposed to shunting them off to this void and hopefully this smoke monster will kill them while they're there. Like, it just... That bit in particular was like, this feels a bit like it was just made up as they were... <laughs> as they as they got to episode four, they're like, where did they go? And they were like, hmm... And they just kind of cobbled 
this excuse together to get them over to Alioth, which will then, uh, I presume, whatever this green portal is in Alioth, will then bring them to uh, Kang, which means wherever Kang is, hand if it is Kang, is inside another dimension, inside Alioth, which is inside the void, which is outside time of space. Like, where are we now? <laughs> It's like listen, all great questions, and I think we have Marvel to thank for that, or to blame for that, essentially, because each time uh, they've obviously taken the opportunity in this particular series to introduce different elements of the uh, of the timeline, um, the the idea of variants as well, like multiple look, and again, like we hear Kid Loki talking about, I kill Thor. Uh, we, we have what was that little frog one you called him again? What's frog. his name? Throg, just Throg. Throg. Um, you've got him as well. You've got uh, Boastful Loki talking about Iron Man and Captain America. And God knows what those guys look like as well. So, um, like, obviously, this series uh, has done what I presume exactly what they needed to do uh, before we see, like, Doctor Strange 2. And it's just there are so many worlds and timelines and dimensions and beings out there that it just gives them license to go, do you know what? anything goes now in a way because um uh, and it feels like i never read the comic books growing up but um it feels like this is the kind of thing that happens in comic book series anyway when they can just take uh different elements of it and just expand it into something else and that just becomes uh part of the overall universe so in a, in a sense it feels like these series these shows are given the writers the opportunity to branch out in a in a similar kind of way so i didn't get as hung up or as bothered by the um well uh, obviously by loki and sylvie as much as you but i similarly with the um oh now we're opening up into into what is a new place i'm just kind of you know what <laughs> i'm gonna sit back around the campfire with the other guys and go yeah i'm just gonna roll with this well i'm like that's fair like listen i'm i'm not taking so much out of it that that i can't enjoy it anymore i like I said, there's parts of this that I thought are some of the best uh, Loki we've seen so far. So far, and there's, there's parts where I'm like, even a single line of dialogue at some point would have helped explain some of this. Like, yeah, I'm not the only one who's feeling a little bit pedantic. Like I was, I sent this to you during the week. We had someone Hurley is their name uh, at Laugh Cry Hurl on Twitter sent in the questions like, can you explain something on your podcast, please? Or on Twitter, I guess, but we're talking about another podcast now. Are all the Loki variants from alternative world worlds? If so, why is there only one sacred timeline that the TVA seems to be pruning? Should there not be as many timelines as there are alternative worlds? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes is the short answer. Yeah, there should, but there isn't. Uh, there's one, and it's never explained why... If one variant on one of the many timelines does something that gets the TVA's attention, we see it branch off from the one timeline. Because surely there would be infinite timelines if there's infinite variants. No? But is this, yeah, but is this not the whole thing that the TVA tell us at the start? Now, we know not to necessarily trust them, but elements of what they were saying originally might be true when we get this little explainer cartoon video, like it was created in the 1980s, and it's saying there were all these timelines, and what they did was they streamlined them into one, the sacred timeline, and I think possibly in episode six we might get more of an answer to this if they do happen to reveal who has uh, the man behind the curtain been pulling the strings and creating these mindless androids, and what is their purpose? Why do they want to um, control all of these various timelines and put them all together and combine them into one? And why do they feel like these Lokis uh, are posing a threat to them uh, across, I don't know how many different worlds and universes as well? So it feels like we might get some more information on that in the next one. But that's the reason I think possibly that there is one is because this person, whatever their powers are, obviously... <laughs> They're unbelievably powerful, mm. especially like I love like out of all 
the magic and the supernatural elements and the illusions and the sorcery and the conjuring that goes on the thing that i'm like really impressed with i was like wow those puppets that they made were really really good those <laughs> those robots were really impressive yep. um that's like uh I, I don't know why that stands out it's like amazing circuitry work guys um but yeah so it feels like possibly we will get some kind of answer to that in episode six that might help explain uh the answer to that particular brain teaser I hope so. Um, I really do. I just, um, yeah, like I think it's just <clears throat> there's some there's some great setups, and I, whenever there's a big swing within the show, and there's many in this, mm -hmm. it's always going to have little niggly questions. Um, and there's a certain point when the niggly questions are fine because. You know, you're having so much fun watching what's happening. But if it gets to lost levels um, where the niggly questions start to outweigh the fun you're having, where you're questioning, why is this happening? Why is this happening? They're not, they're not explaining this. They're not explaining this. I just hope they don't do a lost. And then at the end, we're left with more questions than answers. That's my primary, primary concern, considering we now only have one episode left. Yeah, well, we do have another season coming as well. They have confirmed Series 2 uh, of Loki as well. I'm amazed at how many times Lost has come up in this episode between the Smoke Monster. Yeah, it was Doctor Who bunker. last week, and it's it's a Lost vibe this week. I think it's because it's the, this this particular Void area just, and the Smoke Monster actually did remind me a lot of Lost because it's just a, a weird place where junk seems to land and uh, survivors uh, are just looking for a way out. Um, so it definitely had a lost vibe to it for me. And oh. who sent in that question again? <gasps> yep. Oh my god. Hurley. Hurley. <laughs> I'm going to hurl E from because of all the coincidences. Yeah, too many coincidences. There's definitely something going on. And don't forget, you can use the word boke instead if you like. Thank you. Um, so listen, I think that's everything covered in there. It's a chunky episode. I think it was only about... 48, 49 minutes long, but it feels like a full length and no post -credits. feature film. No post credits. And no post credits uh, this time around. No, definitely not. Um, we see some of the other Lokis and things pop up uh, just with their files, but nothing uh, that I spotted anyway to, to write home about or to talk about here mm. <laughs> today. So we're not going to do it. <laughs> um, so, Roy, thank you uh, as ever. Thank you for accepting my apology earlier. Uh, thank you to Sound Paul on Sound. And as ever. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ of a mighty. Do you know what? I take it back, Sound Paul on Sound. Give me an absolute hurt. Oh, my goodness. Actually, you know, it's you know coming what? up to lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I need to get something to eat. I need to go and have a Philadelphia experiment of my own. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to The Bigger View Ski. And don't forget to subscribe to the show <laughs> for more comedy sound effects like this. Great. See ya. Great. Great stuff. High production value. <laughs>